Welcome everybody to the Iowa's DNR's Ice Fishing Basics webinar. Um, we're going to cover some introductory things that are valuable when exploring the recreational opportunity of ice fishing. Um, with us tonight is Tyler Stubbs. Tyler is a biologist with the Iowa DNR out of the Des Moines area working on our urban fisheries. Um, my name is Scott Grummer. I'm a fisheries biologist based out of Clear Lake in Northern Iowa. And between the two of us, we hope to share some valuable information on this opportunity to get started in a ice fishing adventure out, out in Iowa's outdoors. We also have the first catch center with us tonight. As we go through the webinar, if you do have questions, um, please put those in the Q&A or the chat and we will do our best to answer those as we go through. Um, if we run out of time and there's still some questions, we can do some follow-up as well. But put those questions in. Um, the basics or the, the, the bulk of this program will try to, try to go through quite quickly and allow a fair amount of time in this webinar for that question and answer, because I know there'll be a lot of questions on you know, different aspects of the ice fishing opportunity. So. With that, we will begin our PowerPoint and kind of start to explore that opportunity of a recreation out on Iowa's ice. Um, the, the first and foremost, you know, ice fishing's really a fun opportunity. Make it fun as well, especially if you're out there with, with young anglers, maybe as a family, um, you want to keep it fun. Um, I was ice fishing. You can get by with some some fairly minor purchases of equipment. It doesn't have to be an expensive hobby. Um, you sure can put a lot of money into ice fishing equipment, but not necessarily to just get started and explore that that opportunity. Um, a lot of the fishing equipment that you use through the ice, especially for your your rods and reels, are quite a bit smaller than you may use in the open water season um, when you're fishing with the longer poles. They, the ice fishing poles tend to be shorter um, and a little lighter. The line tends to be lighter. So um, not that you can't use the open water equipment. I see some anglers out there on Iowa's ice using their other equipment, but we'll go through some important aspects of using ice fishing equipment that's designed for that, that type of angling. Uh, the other really great opportunity is, is that access is by foot. Um, you know, we can park, we can get out to areas on, whether it be a pond or a large lake, you can get out to some areas and fish that you couldn't otherwise without a boat in the open water season. So gives a person an opportunity to explore maybe some of those mid lake or distant access points that it's a lake you fish in the in the spring or the summer, but you always wonder what that fishing's like on that far bank or up against a tree line. So gives gives a little bit better access having that sheet of ice to get around. Um, and the fish behavior in the winter is quite a bit different than our our summer season when the water's warm. Uh, fish are cold blooded organisms, and their their bodies slow down some under those cold water conditions. So not quite as aggressive techniques with fishing in the ice season that you may use or see people use in that open water time frame. And first and foremost, a person wants to be safe. We want this fun, but we wanna not put ourselves or our, our friends and family in jeopardy. So you gotta use some, some common sense when out on the ice. And again, you gotta dress for the conditions. Um, I've seen people try to walk out and ice fish in their, their street shoes or tennis shoes, and they, they don't last long on the ice with, with non-insulated boot or footwear. So some important things you can do to make this fishing opportunity a little more enjoyable. Um, next slide, please. Um, Starting with that ice safety, um, these are recommendations for ice thickness and when you should go out, what type of transportation you may use on Iowa's ice. Um, 
generally you'll see in that lower left um, anything less than two inches really is is a time frame when you need to stay off you need to let that ice depth and and thickness grow before it's really safe to, to venture out for this recreational opportunity when it reaches that four inches um, you know that's when it's time a person can walk out you still want to use safety you want to use common sense um, but you can start uh, approaching you know that fishing opportunity when we get anything over four inches of that good clear hard new ice and some people especially in the northern part of Iowa where where my office location is will start to use some wheeled transportation on the ice and the recommendations are there, but again, these are recommendations. It doesn't mean it's 100% safe for a snowmobile up through a truck at all times and under all situations. So always be alert for changing ice conditions, pay attention to the weather. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about some of that, I'm sure as we go through the webinar. Um, one of the most important things is, this is a good opportunity to have a fishing partner with you. Um, for a couple reasons and having that partner, if for some reason there is a situation where the, the ice weakened and, and you go through, if you're by yourself, it's pretty hard for somebody to either go for help or use some of the devices we're gonna talk about to, to help in a situation where there is a, an issue where there's a, a fall through um, or breakthrough near, near shore. Um, Always new clear ice is the thickest, it's the, the hardest and safest, and old ice starts to weaken. And we're sitting right now on January 12th. Um, I consider this, we're approaching the middle of the ice season already. Um, one point that I've always heard is you don't gain much ice after February 1st. And what that means is we're usually on the thawing side of winter, not every day of that February on, but we start to get those melt days um, where things can change. Um, so those are rules of thumb as well. But uh, again, be, be pretty aware of what the weather is. Today, even in Northern Iowa, we were about 46, 47 degrees. So um, that's a situation where we're right in the middle of the winter, but that ice isn't gonna change that quickly up here in Northern Iowa and we're already, we're sitting at about 12 to 14 inches of ice on a lot of lakes in Northern Iowa. Um, 44 to 46 degrees isn't gonna make it unfishable by tomorrow, but that may be different in Southern Iowa, especially where you have some flooded timber or maybe an impoundment or where a storm drain comes in in a metro pond. Um, if you have a significant melt day, there may be thin ice right around that storm drain of a metro fishing area that wasn't there the day before. So again, just be cautious, watch for those objects like flooded trees, anything sticking out, um, flowing water areas like those storm drain or inflows. Um, real late in the ice season, I've actually even seen ice get bad around some garbage or refuse that people left on the ice. They they may have left a, a cardboard box or a, you know, an old fishing towel. And if it's dark, that solar heat's gonna, gonna absorb through that towel and, and impact a relatively small part of that ice sheet. But yet you don't wanna necessarily walk right up to a, a tree sticking out of the ice or something in mid-February, because it could be thin right around the immediate area of that, that tree and where it comes through the ice. Next slide. Here's some of the safety equipment. Um, and most of these things have a value to have with you. Um, do you have to have every single one at all times? Maybe not, but these are just some of the recommended things, some sort of flotation. Um, the picture in the upper left is a flotation coat. Um, so not only is it for warmth, but if a person wearing that coat would fall through, it'll keep them buoyant and give them a better chance to, to right themselves up on top of the ice or give them time for a partner to get something to help them get on top of the ice. Immediately below that, the 
ice cleats. Um, this is pretty important so far this winter. Um, I know here in the northern part of the state, we have very little snow cover on the lakes. We've just avoided the, the, the snowfalls and that ice gets pretty slippery. So the ice cleats are really kind of a personal safety thing so a person doesn't slip. Um, I'm sure there's a number of emergency room visits where somebody slipped on ice, whether it's on a lake or a parking lot and has to go for a, a broken wrist or elbow or forearm. Um, so the ice cleats just help with that traction and, and uh, avoid those kind of slips and trips and falls. Um, the ice picks on that lower row right next to the ice cleats, if a person would go through um, what they're designed, that, that tether, that black tether is around your neck. If you would happen to drop through the ice, um, you can grab those picks and kind of use to claw yourself back up. Because the biggest problem, if a person does have a situation on ice, everything's slippery and it's pretty hard to right yourself and get back up onto the ice. So that's what those are designed for. The throw jug there, um, there's a lot of varieties of that. I've seen people use exactly what's in the picture. Um, they make manufactured throw bags. Um, and also sometimes you can just tie a, a boat cushion that you would maybe have in your boat in the open water season to a length of rope. And that's where that partner comes in play. Um, if the partner can have that with their equipment and yourself goes through, um, that's what can be tossed from safe ice or where your partner's still on stable ice over to help get you up on top of that ice sheet in the event there is, a, is an issue. Um, some of the other stuff, um, cell phone there in the upper right, you know, just an opportunity to make contact quickly if there's an issue with yourself and your fishing party or possibly you see an issue with somebody else that's out there trying that same recreation. Um, so just gives us a little bit quicker time to get maybe uh, some emergency response if that's the case. Um, as far as warmth, the hand warmers there, um, people use those for a lot of out outdoor winter recreation, whether you're skiing, cross country skiing, um, not a bad idea, especially for, for younger kids um, that have trouble keeping their hands warm anyway. Um, just makes that fishing experience a little more pleasurable, keeping, keeping the extremities warm. And the first aid kit, obviously, probably, you know, one of the things that's least used, but it's nice to have if uh, maybe a, a cut by a hook or unhooking a fish and a gill cover, you know, cuts your finger. Um, there's a few opportunities, you know, where maybe a first aid kit is not bad. Does it have to be with you on the ice at all times? Probably not as critical as, as those other items, but at least maybe back in your vehicle in the parking lot that you could retrieve it if you need it. So next slide, please. So this again is kind of the comfort level of being out there on the ice. And it's really similar to a lot of the clothing that you'd need for other types of winter recreation. You definitely want to dress in layers, um, get that base layer, you know, whether it be thermals or long underwear, something that's moisture wicking. Um, you, you kind of build up a sweat getting to your fishing spot because sometimes you have to walk through maybe deep snow on a different winter than this one or go a considerable distance and then you're kind of hot and sweaty when you get there. When you sit down to start fishing, that's when the cold sets in. Then get those other outside insulating layers, that mid layer for, you know, like some polar fleece or some sort of fleece jacket. And then something to block wind and water on that outer layer. Um, typically open ice, what I call open ice fishing, where you're pretty much just sitting out there on a stool or a bucket. Typically what gets you the coldest is, is the windy days. You can fish on a very cold, calm day and be as comfortable as a, as a day similar to what we had today, at least in, in parts of Iowa. But if that wind starts to blow, that'll change. Um, you know, it can be nice and warm out, but a strong wind is gonna, gonna reduce that uh, wind chill and, and add that need for those clothing layers. Boots and socks, um, I can't get over 
you know, you gotta, you gotta have your feet are in contact with the ice the whole time while you're out there. So good insulated boots with some heavy socks and then a, a pair of gloves too, to, to keep your, your hands and your fingers and that warm. So you, you gotta do some line tying or, or, you know, bait your hook. Um, you need, you need that dexterity in your fingers. When you get so cold, you can't start to to use the fingers then you know it's gonna gonna make that ice fishing trip less enjoyable as well so um and another thing besides the boots and socks that aren't on this uh, slide um remember i said your your feet are in contact with the ice almost all the time what i've used and i've seen other people use is a scrap of old carpeting or maybe even a, a piece of cardboard and put that as another layer between the bottom of your feet and your ice and the ice when you're at your fishing location. Um, but I will say, make sure you take that type of material back with you at the end of the trip and not, not leave a, a square of carpet freezing in the ice out there because that'll be one of those solar heat um, absorbers as we get later in the ice season and possibly cause a hazard area. So next slide, please. As far as fishing regulations, it's good for everybody to, to, to review those, whether it's open water fishing or ice fishing, There's the regulations do not change as far as uh, fish size limits and, and fish quantity limits. Um, they're the same open water and ice, but uh, review those if you're a very entry level angler, make sure you know what the, the size restrictions or, or daily bag limits are for our, our fish in Iowa. And ice fishing shelters, like you see in the picture there, that may be a little bit more advanced item that people buy rather than a very basic beginner, but you'll see a lot of people using ice fishing shelters. And as long as you use that ice fishing shelter and take it back off with you, um, there's, there's nothing really needed as far as a license registration or any name or address on it. Um, but up here in the northern part of the state, we do have people that leave ice shelters out on the ice um, overnight unattended, and we do ask those to be reflected uh, with name and address, and that's just a safety thing. So a snowmobile's headlights or something picks up on that, that shelter out on the ice, and we don't have a, a collision from that. Um, make sure you get your fishing license. Um, those of you that angle just a little bit or, or even angle frequently, um, our Iowa ice fishing or our Iowa fishing licenses are good till January 10th. At that point, you need to purchase for the next year. So if you had a 2021 license and you want to go fishing today, you got to get in and, and get that new license after January 10th. Um, and a lot of license vendors scattered across the state. There's online purchase options. So a lot of opportunities to go in and get that license before you get out and recreate on Iowa's waters angling. A little bit on ethics and angler etiquette. Um, some ice fishermen are, are pretty secretive and they wanna be off by themselves and don't necessarily enjoy somebody coming real close. Others are pretty social and take it as a social activity. Um, typically what I use as a, just kind of a general rule of thumb, um, probably try not to set up closer than 40, 50 yards from another party, unless they invite you closer. Um, you know, test the waters, I guess, make it social, maybe ask them how the fishing's going, but, uh, um, don't, don't really think that everybody wants, you know, somebody saddled up right beside them. Um, it can be a fun experience having a group of people chatting, talking about what they're catching or what they've done, but you just got to kind of use a little bit of a common sense there as far as angler etiquette and ethics, just how close you get to other parties. Next slide, please. So we'll start down the road of equipment. Um, Really short, flexible rods um, are the typical types of equipment you wanna use for the ice season. And what I mean by flexible rods, if you look at the picture in the lower right, um, that's my panfish rod. 
and it takes very little resistance or pull to, to bend that, that rod tip that far. Like we said, fish's metabolism slows and they're much more um, lethargic. They don't bite as hard and they, they don't move around as much under the ice. So the bites are often quite subtle and you need something to give you an indication of when that bite is, is happening. The other option to that flexible rod tip is um, the picture of the black fishing pole there that's got the, the length range. Um, there's a little teeny foam bobber on that and that can be your strike indicator too. That, that pole has a very rigid tip to it. It's, you're not gonna detect a, a light bite through that rod tip, but the foam bobber is your, is your light strike indicator. And that's why the picture right next to it shows a variety of small fishing bobbers and floats. Um, as far as your, what we call terminal tackle or your hooks, um, you wanna keep everything pretty small. Um, the picture to the far left there um, shows the sizes. Um, a lot of that fishing equipment, a lot of uh, hooks in general have a, a sizing. And that's just kind of a general recommendation there, eight, size eight to 12. So um, if you're kind of new to ice fishing, not exactly sure what is meant by small, um, you'll see those those number ranges on the on the size of the hook, and you definitely the the smaller the number, the bigger the hook. Um, so the the size two hook would be way too big for ice fishing, but that size eight to twelve, and actually the size twelve hook is smaller than the eight. So um, just keep that in mind. Small light um, going to give you a much better chance of of knowing you, that you got a bite out there when you're angling through the ice. And as far as bait goes, um, some people prefer to go without live bait, but I would definitely recommend uh, beginning ice fishermen uh, to, to get some form of, of insect larvae bait. That's a, that's a normal bait or a very common bait for ice fishermen. Um, what's pictured in the, the picture there are waxworms. Um, it's just a, a fly larvae um, and then the, what's meant by a wiggler um, it's just a different species of insect it's it's larval stage um, they're pretty small maybe quarter to a half inch in size so very good for the pan fish especially bluegill um, crappie and those are good species to start with so that that's what's you can go to the bait shop get minnows um, the problem with minnows you know you got to keep your minnow bucket with water Another piece of equipment to go out there, water tips over, how do you keep the minnows alive? You can't get water back into the bucket quick enough before your, your minnows freeze. Um, but sometimes minnows are a good bait if you're fishing some of the larger predators that we have in some of our lakes, maybe minnows are, is an option, but definitely not a necessity. Next slide, please. So we got our kind of our fishing pole and the tackle, um, everything like that. Uh, but to fish through the ice, we have, we actually we we need a few other things um, and some pretty simple equipment too. Uh, really, a five gallon bucket is a almost a must for a couple reasons for ice fishing. One, you need to store that equipment, um, get it to your fishing site, and also keep it in your in your transportation, your car, your truck, um, trunk. Um, some other things, when you do drill a hole through the ice, um, it doesn't come out perfectly clean. You have a whole bunch of ice shavings or slush in that. Um, that orange ladle with the, the silver handle there is what we call a skimmer or a strainer. And you use that to get all the fine ice shavings out so you have a clear water hole to fish down through. And the other thing is a is a depth finder in the in the lower right there you'll see a kind of an alligator type mouth clip with a an orange um, cylinder on the end of it. That cylinder is filled with lead. And if we click on the video there, I'll explain how how to set your depth using that versus maybe a, a depth finder that you'd have on your boat. So the angler clips that alligator clip onto that small ice jig. 
lowers that down through the hole until it comes in contact with bottom. Then they reach down and pinch that line where bottom is at. As they bring that up, you don't want to fish right on the bottom. So maybe pull up four to six inches of line like that angler did. Um, put that bobber in that place and then lower it down again to check and that bobber will actually sink about four to six inches below the ice and that tells you how far above the bottom that your bait will be below that bobber. So that is how you can do a really inexpensive setting your depth on a bobber. Um, as people get more advanced into ice fishing, they use some electronics to, to do the same thing, but that's a that's probably about a $1.50 way to, to set a bobber depth and get pretty accurate with setting that depth out on the, the lake or pond that you're fishing. Next slide, please. Uh, we got to get that hole augered through there. I, I explained the skimmer. Um, there's several different types of augers that you can get. The most expensive, most inexpensive is what we call a hand auger. And that's gonna be in that upper center picture. Um, it's got a kind of a curvature to the handle and you crank that around and the, on the bottom or the, the left side of that picture, there's actually very sharp blades that, that auger that or skim or cut that ice through that hole. Um, augers come in a variety of sizes and i will tell you the 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 larger the diameter they usually come in anything from four to ten inches in diameter so that means you can cut a hole to that either four inch up to a ten inch hole the the bigger you get that auger the harder it's going to be to drill you can drill a hole much easier and quicker with a five inch auger versus an eight inch um, so you can catch some pretty good sized fish through a five, six or seven inch augered hole and don't feel like you need a, a large hole through the ice to get some pretty nice fish. The other auger, if you get a little more into ice fishing is, is my drill setup. Um, it actually uses a cordless drill to turn it so you don't have to crank it by hand. Um, but you got a little more investment there. And a lot of people are going to these setups with cordless drills and, and there's also gas powered augers. So in the off season, if you watch garage, garage sales, you can pick up a pretty inexpensive hand auger. Um, the thing with the hand augers, keep in mind, they got very sharp blades at the bottom. Um, keep your auger cover, um, that blue cover there on my, my cordless drill setup protects those blades and it also protects you because you can cut your hand, you can cut your finger. Um, so auger your hole and get that, that protective cover back on. But the other reason to keep it to not only cut yourself, if, if you nick those blades, um, and what I mean nick it, if you set that down on concrete without the cover on it, the next time you go to drill a hole, it won't drill. Um, they're they're pretty precise on their 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 curvature, and if you get a blemish in that, you won't be able to auger that hole. Um, you can also buy all of these equipment items at at most sporting goods stores. Um, they're they're pretty easy to find. Um, typically, the ice fishing equipment starts going on the sporting goods shelves probably in October, and they start taking it off late February. So. Um, definitely can be purchased. Um, you can watch for it. Um, the other thing that I've recommended people do if you want to explore ice fishing and maybe don't want to start making some of these investments, you want to see if you like it. Um, again, it goes to that angler etiquette thing, but people are pretty nice on the ice. And if, if you go to a spot that's got some anglers out there, I bet you wouldn't have to ask too many people and they drill a hole for you as long as it's not right beside them. So, um, you know, approach that carefully, but you know, that that's an opportunity. And then also augered holes on a lake definitely doesn't mean that other people can't fish them. If people, people commonly will drill 15, 20 holes, but they may only fish two or three of them 
or leave for the day. So there, sometimes there's opportunities to just go out there and use holes that have been pre-drilled by somebody else. But if somebody's close by, ask permission first, or it's a good, good etiquette thing. Next slide. Hey, Scott, I'm going to toss in a question real quick here, and I was going to type an answer to it, but other people might have that. Somebody did ask, what do you think this is too big to um, bring through the hole that you have? And I said, that'd be a great problem to have, <laughs> but you might want to speak to that you can land a relatively large fish through a, like a six inch hole. So, so obviously, um, like I said, you, you'd be surprised how big a fish you can get through a six inch hole. Um, I've, Personal, in my personal experience, I've gotten some some pretty nice uh, walleye, northern pike, channel catfish through a six inch hole. And I don't think I've ever caught a fish that I couldn't get through a six inch hole. Um, if a person got into a situation where you had a five or six inch hole and, and maybe, you know, we're fishing a water body that had very large predators in it, like a muskie, um, you may be in a situation where you can't get that fish through the hole, and it's pretty hard to enlarge that after that fish is on the end of your line. Um, probably a situation that's going to be a great memory. I had a heck of a fish. I just couldn't get it through the ice. Um, unless it's very thin, I've, I've heard of people trying to drill holes around the, the original hole to, to make it larger, but um, there's a good chance that line's going to get cut before that happens. But um, don't think that you need that that great big hole just to catch that because six inches is the biggest auger that I that I typically use ice fishing and that's that's adequate in ninety nine percent of the catches you're going to have out there. And Scott, there was another one. Uh, somebody asked about how far do you fish off the bottom, and I give them my basic advice is to start about a foot off the bottom with your fishing in the end. The one thing about ice fishing is knowing that if you're not catching fish, don't just stay there because um, you, you need to move. Um, right. And, uh, um, but, but to come up higher and, and if you try a few different depths and it's not working to just move, so. Yeah, so, so my recommendation for a starting point, I always go that four to six inches off the bottom. That's, that's where you wanna start. If it's not working like, like was mentioned, try it up a little higher. Um, one thing with certain species of fish, and we're not gonna get into a lot of subtle details about angling for specific fish in this webinar, but I'll just give you a, for instance, uh, crappie tend to suspend or what we, what we call suspend in the water column. They may be halfway down if you're fishing in 20 foot of water. Well, if you start six inches off the bottom and stay there your whole fishing trip and there's crappie in the, in the lake or area you're fishing and never come up and try that mid-water depth, you're probably not going to catch them if they're, they're all at that 10 foot deep in 20 foot of water. So try it for a while, um, start moving up, but don't be afraid to move back down. Um, I'd say 90% of my fishing trips, I don't do anything different, but four to six inches off the bottom. But if it's not working, try something different. So With that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Tyler and talk about choosing locations. Um, he's got some good information to share with you on different fishing opportunities, especially in, in some of our larger metro areas. Yeah, thanks Scott, lots of good information. I always learn something new when I talk to you or, or hear you talk, I had never even thought about bringing a piece of carpet with me to keep my feet off the ice. So I'm gonna to have to keep that, put throw that in the sled next time I go out. So good information. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to choose a fishing location, how to find out how to choose one. Um, there's lots of information on the DNR's website. Uh, you can always check. There's lots of uh, fishing Facebook groups that are out there that, that uh, folks are talking about you know, certain lakes or ponds uh, or resources to go to. Um, but the DNR Fisheries web Fishing website, uh, we've got a lot of information on there. You can also contact your local conservation board. In some instances, you can contact your, your city as well. Uh, so next slide, please.
So what I've got up there now is the Fish Local page, and we'll put that uh, link in the chat uh, so you've got that. But this is a page that uh, has a lot of our urban water bodies on it. So whether you live in the Des Moines Metro or Cedar Rapids area or, or up in Scotts World there in Mason City, uh, those urban ponds, which the majority of them are owned by uh, the cities, but some of them are owned by the counties, are going to be on here. And um, those, these are places that, you know, we know that they have a fish population in them. We've worked with the cities on them. And uh, there's, there's a good place for you to potentially catch fish and they're all public access. And so if you're ever wondering, you know, you're driving down the street or, or uh, you know, driving down the highway and think, I wonder if I can fish that pond, you know, in Ankeny, or I wonder if I can fish that pond in Sioux City. Uh, this fish local page will have that on there. We've done that work for you already. Next slide, please. So if you click on one of those water bodies uh, that come up, um, you'll see a few different things, uh, some different information that are on there. So this is a sawgrass pond. It's a pond located in the city of Ankeny. And uh, we've got who owns it, how big it is, its coordinates if you're, if you're into that, uh, for finding locations that way. Otherwise, this is a Google map too, uh, so you can, can get the location there. Uh, fish species that are present or that we've stocked. So this one's got largemouth bass, bluegill, channel catfish, and crappies in it. Uh, we didn't stock the crappies, but but it's got the other three we've stocked in there. And then uh, it's specific location. And then I've added in if you, you can if you can ice fish it or not. So many cities uh, allow ice fishing and some do not. And I think I saw a question on the chat on there earlier. So if it's if it's on here, I'm in the process of, of going through and making sure I've got those updated. Uh, some cities, even if they do allow ice fishing, they may not on certain water bodies, whether it's because of, of consistent poor ice conditions, uh, you know, maybe it gets a lot of runoff, you know, has a large watershed. Uh, so there may be a chance for, for that ice to not form properly. Um, some of the pits that are along the rivers uh, don't allow ice fishing. Uh, as, as they may be connected to the river water level. And so there's a few of those types of instances out there, uh, but we've tried to do that work for you as well to, to show you where you can and cannot ice fish. Uh, but if the information is not on our website yet, your best bet is to contact your, your local city hall and or parks department and ask the question there and to, to get the right answer. The one thing you don't wanna do is just start going out there and, and, and ice fishing because there may be a city ordinance against that, or you may accidentally be on, on private property. Um, so make sure you're, you're checking those out. But the Fish Local page is a good place to, to go to get started, especially if you're located in some of these more urban areas. Uh, next slide, please. Another good resource on our website is um, the Fishing Atlas. And so this is a map of Clear Lake. And the cool thing about the fishing atlas is a lot of our larger water bodies are on here. And as you can see, this is also a depth map. And so you can get this on your cell phone. It's very mobile friendly. You can, it'll actually kind of track your location if you have that feature turned on. And you can see where you're at potentially depth wise on the lake with your location. And so that can also be another tool in your toolbox to use when trying to find what that potential depth is you can use some of these depth maps that we've already created. And so these are really handy. I use these, uh, when I've been up to Clear Lake, I've used it um, and they're just nice to have as far as, as being able to find those depths. You can see where those points are, like on the south side of the lake. I'm sure that has a specific name, Scott, but there's a, a point there that jets quite a ways out into the lake. Those are, are good places to, to target. And so those are a couple really good things on the DNR's website that you can utilize uh, for finding somewhere to go fish uh, close to where you live. Um, if you have any questions on any of those, feel free to, to reach out to us. If certain water bodies aren't located on there, or if you have just general questions about some of the water bodies uh, when you're out there, feel free to give your local biologist a call. We're happy to help uh, point you in the right direction uh, or your conservation board or, or whoever. And so there's lots of support when, when trying to get outdoors. Uh, next slide, please. As we're transitioning, Tyler, I'm going to jump in. Uh, there were some questions about ice thickness in some uh, like central Iowa and eastern Iowa. 
Um, I've heard reports of five to six inches. You may know more than I do, but um, I'm just recommending to everybody, just check the ice when you get there. Uh, there's a lot of folks going out, but um, depending on the size of the water, um, wind, if, they, if there's water <clears throat> coming into it, you always just need to check as you go is, is a really good rule of thumb to follow. Uh, but six is what I've heard, of, do you have different information? Yeah, that's that's about right, Barb. Um, I want to say, you know, today some of the Ankeny ponds that I I um, heard about, we had some staff out there, um, was anywhere from six to eight inches. But again, and one thing to realize too is just because it's six inches in one spot, kind of like Scott talked about earlier, you know, you may walk, you know, ten feet and it's two inches, um, or you get close to some of those outflows coming into the pond through the storm drains. And, you know, in some cases, those are, are almost open water all season long. And so that ice depth can really change uh, from one area to the next. So it's good to keep checking the, the ice conditions as you head out. Uh, you know, just consider it to be something that you need to do because it, it can't change whether you're on a small pond or, or a large water body. Um, but I think generally right now we're in that, you know, six inch range, uh, which is, is good ice. and. As Scott mentioned, a lot of it's clear. And so we're kind of in the early ice stage now, so it's good hard ice. And um, we're gonna have, uh, we had some water on the ice. Today, some grains are, it'll be just a little bit weaker. Scott, what and you got up there in, in Iowa? So most of our northern Iowa lakes we're seeing in that 10 to 14 inch range, um, but it's been a unique ice forming year and we're, we have a few lakes that actually have some open holes in them yet that haven't completely froze over. And some of that's due to waterfowl usage um, with the snow free landscape. We got Canada geese and trumpeter swans um, keeping some holes open and we also get some cracks or ridges in the ice and those areas can always be different than the, the surrounding. Um, and then just another general rule of thumb, like I said, I kind of consider us in the middle of the ice season, but as we get into February, keep in mind that the sun's angle starts getting more and more pronounced or higher in the sky. So the North shore is gonna start to break away from the bank quicker than the, maybe the South shore. Um, so keep in mind that, you know, the winter changes and as the day length gets longer, the sun gets higher, um, a spot you were at a few days earlier with a, a few good melt days, you know, you might just want to really survey, especially that entry point out onto that ice. Um, I'm going to jump in. We have about 15 minutes left and I have two really good questions that I'm going to um, maybe the behavior and the tactics pieces, because some of that's pretty similar. But uh, the first of all, on the um, fishing atlas map, the white squares, what, what are those that were on the Clear Lake map that was shown? I believe those were the some fish attractors or uh, some other, some things, uh, some habitat that we've added. Is that correct, Scott? So as you're looking at what's up on the screen right now, the white that you're seeing are actually numerical depths of the contours. So if you zoomed in a little bit further, you'd actually see the, um, you know, it's gonna say 12 feet or 14 feet. And that's giving you the depth on that, that lighter shaded blue line that you see. But then if you continue on that fishing atlas and zoom in real tight, um, then our, our habitat points start showing up. and Clear Lake doesn't have a lot of manually placed habitat in it, but if you get into some of the central Iowa, southern Iowa lakes, um, you know, there's things placed in these water bodies like cedar tree piles, um, pallet structures, uh, you know, wide variety of fish habitat. So this fishing atlas doesn't only show you the the basin, the basin depths, but it also shows you some habitat points. And like Tyler mentioned, if you have the feature turned on to show where you're at um, in the proximity of that map that's showing up, you can walk pretty close and get 
real close to maybe a cedar tree brush pile to fish for panfish through the ice, will it get you necessarily right on top of it? It may, the icon or the point may show you're close. You might have to do a little bit of searching around, but, but you can be comfortable knowing that there's some habitat nearby on that. So. And um, this goes right along with it. And you, you kind of started into it. Aaron had a question about physical features to look for that are good to target for ice fishing because he doesn't have a black vexlar. Um, and yeah, that, that's, you know, if you got 250 to 350 bucks or more, you can get one of those. But if you're going without it, um, th that's one thing I think you just mentioned with the fishing atlas, it can show you some of where some of that habitat's at. Um, and you talked about the contour lines, but uh, just anything else in terms of recommendations of places to, to hit um, for ice fishing, if you're going out there with, without electronics. So if, I, if I'm going to fish a, a brand new spot, and I don't know much about the lake and I don't have the, some of the modern, you know, electronic devices, I would say ice fish, all species, you know, across the board for species we're going to angle through the ice are going to be probably in two places to start. Some of it, they just go to deep water in the winter. So sometimes you don't have to have ne necessarily any habitat or structure. If you're fishing a farm pond, you know, maybe go out in front of the dam in the, in the deeper portion of that basin and start there. If they're not there, then see if you can see some habitat maybe poking through the ice, whether that be a, a twig or a brush sticking up, that would be a visual cue that there might be habitat there. And then up in my neck of the woods on my natural lakes, um, we have quite a few rush lines. They're either cattails or, or native bulrush stands along shore and anglers will find the edges of those. And you're only fishing in three feet of water, but the fish are there because of the stems of the, the rushes and cattails. So I usually always start deep in smaller ponds, um, look for visual cues. And then if you're on some of the bigger natural lakes, maybe try some of that near shore rushes because that's habitat. You can see the, the stem sticking through the ice. And, and like we mentioned with setting the depth, if you're not catching anything at the bottom, raise it up. If you're not catching anything in the first spot you chose, don't give it two hours, give it a good try. And you don't have to move far sometimes. I, the thing about ice fishing, like I said, that metabolism and fish movement is, is you know, really minimized in the ice. Maybe move 50 yards and try a different spot or, or you know, try a different depth and move a little closer to shore. So um, just gotta be a little bit mobile sometimes if you're not finding fish on that first site. So. And, and that was a question that was that you already answered there, Scott, that was in um, the, the Q&A session was um, asking about how long should you stay. And uh, it, it just depends. But like in 30 minutes, if you're like you say, if you're not finding anything, those fish aren't moving that fast. Um, and this kind of goes into the tactics. That was our next section. Um, our answers sort of got ahead of that, but that's OK, because it plays right into the behavior and the tactics. So um, if we want to circle back to that. And if we have just a few more questions, we have about 10 minutes before our time's up. So, you know, that fish behavior, um, like I said, everything's slow um, and they don't move around. So sometimes you have to move to those, but uh, um, like we mentioned on, on this slide, you know, you got to sometimes drill a few more holes to find fish. Don't assume the, the first spot you drill is going to be the, the, the best spot on that water body, but it may be. Um, vary up not only the depth, but maybe how rapidly you're moving your bait, um, whether you're aggressively jigging it or just letting it sit. And one thing that kind of gives an example of that, sometimes bluegill um, fishing through the ice you have to know more than just reach down and put the, the monofilament line between your index finger and your thumb and spin it. And what you're doing down there, you're not jigging that small ice jig up and down and moving it rapidly, you're just making it twirl. And that could be the difference of a fish biting or not. Sometimes they want it perfectly stationary. So, um, you know, vary up. If it's not working, try something a little different, whether it's depth, different location or different movement of that jig. Um, like we said here, where, where will the fish be? Um, 
theoretically they could be anywhere, but typically they go to deeper water in the, in the ice season, um, unless there's habitat that, that pulls them into a different spot. That habitat could be natural or, or artificially placed in those. Use that fishing atlas to, to zoom in and see if there's some fish habitat on that selected water body you're thinking of making that trip to. So next slide. Uh, Scott, I'm going to toss in a question, and I think you kind of answered it because I don't, I don't think it varies based on the lake, but we had a question about advice for a newcomer on West Lake Okaboji, which is a, a big water. So, Yeah, well, you know, newcomer, I've never fished West Okaboji myself, but it's not, it, it's, it's definitely, a, a, you know, Iowa's deepest natural lake, um, very clear water. Um, I wouldn't say it's going to be your easiest spot for a beginner to fish, but that doesn't mean a be beginner can't go out there and have a good trip. Um, the, the things I hear about West Okaboji with that water clarity, we talked about, you know, you, you, you use light equipment, light tackle. Um, sometimes they have to drop down to um, the, the fishing line is rated by a pound test or how much pull it takes for that to break. And I've heard some seasons over there for especially like bluegill fishing on West Okaboji, you have to go to one pound line. Um, I've never personally used one pound monofilament line when I'm fishing, I go with four or six pound. Um, so you, sometimes, you know, those really clear systems, you actually have to even go smaller and more subtle, but uh, you know, they fish a lot of the bays on West Okaboji, since it's such a big deep lake, those fish aren't gonna be out in the 100 foot deep portion of West Okaboji very often. Um, they're gonna be in, in those shallower bays. And what those shallower bays have is, is aquatic plant growth down there on the bottom. So it's that natural habitat. So you can fish close to shore if you're fishing West Okaboji, um, fish the bays, um, but it's a deep lake, takes longer to freeze over so that ice safety and ice aware, awareness even heightened on a lake like that. Um, you might be able to fish um, another lake in, the, in that part of the state like Minnewashta maybe three weeks sooner than you can get out on West Okaboji just because it's a shallow lake versus the deep lakes. They're gonna freeze at different rates, so. Anybody have questions? Barb can relay them to us. Um, if there's some more questions there, Barb, that we can answer, um, you know, looks like we're at that point. Um, unless people bring some new questions up, you can have two. Just like it's it's the same rules as for every other time of the year. Too whole privilege. Um, and and there was a question about focus on finding structure habitat over depth for finding fish. Um, part of that gets a little bit more complex when you do those big waters. Um, so I guess I'm going to toss in here. My thought is, as somebody who's a pretty uh, casual um, angler, smaller water bodies, some of those ponds are a great place to start figuring out how to uh, do things versus um, starting with really big water. I mean, not that you can't fish the big water, but it's, it's easier to start small. Um, so, so that's one thing that I would throw in there. Um, and then it basically, the, a couple other questions. Um, it was, how long does it take for ice to freeze thaw? And that, um, if you want to just talk a little bit about that, about the cold weather, the, you know, how many days of cold weather you have to have for that. Okay, yeah. Um, how long does it take for ice to form and then also on the reverse side to melt? And a lot of it really depends on the weather, obviously. The other thing that can really change ice development is whether there's a blanket of snow on it. And um, I was on Clear Lake last week. And if we had a snow drift that was say four inches deep, the ice was maybe two inches thinner than it was 20 feet away where there was no snow on the ice. So, you know, don't think just because snow is frozen and cold, it doesn't insulate and, and protect that. So we've had a really snow free for the most part start to a lot of Iowa's. I know Southern Iowa's probably got more snow than, than Northern Iowa. So you definitely, if you've had a, a heavy snowfall that ice development's gonna be altered by that. Um, but 
the ice really tends to weaken on the thawing side of winter that I've noticed when you start getting those nighttime lows that are staying near freezing point or above. When you start getting 24 hours periods where there's no freezing temperatures, ice is gonna change rapidly from that point on when you get into that part of the winter. And that's usually you know anywhere from mid-February on depending on where you're at in, in the state. And uh, there was a question about Lake Cornelia for ice fishing. I don't know if either of you can answer that since that's not your area, but. Um... Um, I do have Lake Cornelia. Was it just as the fishing good or? Do, do... Um, I don't, I don't see the question on mine, but um, Lake Cornelia, um, high density of panfish, especially yellow bass. The size quality isn't quite as good on the yellow bass as say some of the other lakes that we have those, um, but it's not a bad spot for maybe a beginner to go because you got a chance of catching a lot of fish. You may not catch a whole bunch that you want to take home, but what I've found with, with beginning ice fishermen is success is key, especially for those younger anglers. They just soon be catching something than, than nothing. Um, and another kind of tip that, that falls into to Tyler's uh, program and mine is if you want a little bit better chance of success on maybe a first trip, pay attention to our urban trout stockings. You do have to invest in a trout fee to fish those. Um, but if we have an organized event on an urban trout stocking, um, we've kind of had to suspend some of those due to COVID situations. But when we start those up, we really try everything we can do on, a, on an organized event day to get everybody there to catch a fish. And it, it, it is a, a pretty good opportunity to have success and have some mentors maybe, or some people that, you know, there'll be DNR staff or city or county staff there and that's a great opportunity to maybe maybe try that first one if you're close to one of those urban trout stockings. Yeah. Uh, who are in the Des Moines area, if you're a beginning ice angler, uh, we're actually doing a um, first catch center event January 23rd in the afternoon, two to four at Terra Park, which is there in Johnston on the north side of Des Moines. And we'll be doing really basic stuff, but if you haven't done it before, um, We'll be drilling some holes and you can practice doing some basic ice fishing and um, wanted to throw that out there. And then there are questions in the um, chat. There was a question and I've had a few about the recording. Uh, I think technology is with us and we'll have a recording uh, as soon as I can get that cleaned up. We will post that. And uh, the last question that I have on here that I'm is that do the trout stock make it even into the winter? And I think either of you could answer that one. Yeah, so the trout stockings that we have, we've got those in, I want to say we're up to 18 locations now across the state. They get two stockings each year. So they typically get a fall stocking and then they get a, a winter or a spring stocking. And so, yeah, the, the winter time is actually really the prime time in those ponds to catch those trout. Now you do need a trout, you pay the trout fee uh, along with your license. It's another 1450 and that money goes to support the trout program. Uh, but those trout stockings are, as Scott mentioned, when we can have, yeah, when we can have events and get back to having events, uh, we'll get hundreds of people out there and, uh, you know, helping people catch fish and, and tie knots and drill holes. And it's a, it's a great time. And all those locations are located on our, our website. There's a trout specific page on there, uh, but we've got those from, from coast to coast. So Council Bluffs in Sioux City, all the way over to, to Dubuque and, and the Davenport area. And, um, so there's lots of places for to check those out. Uh, one thing too I wanted to mention uh, was another resource for you is our weekly fishing report. And that goes out every Thursday. And that's another good way to get some ideas on what the ice conditions look like. Uh, those, the district biologists out in the state and the district staff update those